Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. 35. A psalm that... <laughs> wow. David gets a bit upset with some friends of his. And boy, he calls down wrath on them. <laughs> you won't believe how he does. It's a very long psalm. Uh, my translation has it broken up a bit differently probably than I would, would divide it up. But uh, if you have a translation of the Bible here tonight, I want you to read... Uh, verses 1 through 10, with me please. I think it better you read it in your translation. 1 through 10. A preliminary question about interpreting the Old Testament that I think is very appropriate here because this psalm has been, was quoted by Jesus Christ in John 15. Many people believe that the setting of the words of David fit much more the life of Jesus Christ than they do David. And that brings up a very important question as to what extent is David a type or a foreshadowing of the person of Jesus Christ? I have, uh, in my personal Bible study, I become very uncomfortable with a loose, free type of typology. For I feel like that typology can be used to prove anything, make the Bible say anything, back up any kind of incorrect theology simply by going back somewhere in the Old Testament, picking up a type and saying this is what God meant to teach in this setting. Now I do understand that the New Testament writers use many, many Old Testament allusions in writing the New Testament. But in a real sense, the New Testament writers are in, inspired and illuminated to a greater degree than any of us ever will be. And therefore, I am very comfortable with the types that are listed in the New Testament, but very uncomfortable with making types for myself simply because they, are, they may have an analogous application to New Testament principles. This is one of those times. I do believe that we see much more clearly the intent and purpose of God from this side of the cross that even a person like David saw when he wrote this psalm. I believe that the Old Testament begins to sparkle with the illumination of God's Spirit from this side of the cross that the Old Testament Jew never, ever saw. And yet, because I've been exposed to a very loose, free kind of allegorical interpretation, uh, it, it makes me very nervous to cut loose any kind of principle of biblical interpretation that says, you just go back in there and however God's Spirit leads you, you just find what's best for you. Now, there are some very real principles to interpret the Word of God. And therefore, I think, in a sense, we can say that the life of David in some point is analogous to the life of Christ. But I do not think that the reason that David wrote this psalm was so that simply because Jesus Christ would have certain words to say at a certain point in his ministry. I believe this experience was real in the life of David, that he wrote it under inspiration for God's people, including the Old Testament people of God. I do believe that we can look back with a, a newness and a freshness on this psalm as we understand Jesus Christ today. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Don't make the Old Testament say more than the Old Testament wants to say. You have been confronted with, with a, a, a defect of Christianity called Jehovah Witnesses. If you let Jehovah Witnesses prove their theology out of the book of Ecclesi Ecclesiastes to you, they can prove things that you have never heard of anywhere else in the Bible. But they will say, here it is. The Bible says it. Doesn't that make it true? Now, again, I want to say to you, the Bible saying something one time does not necessarily make it a fact. We believe not in one or two isolated verses to build our understanding of God on, 
that we build our understanding of God on the sweep of the biblical revelation from old to new. Therefore, I understand Jesus Christ by the New Testament and not by a typological approach in the Old Testament, although I think that many things in the Old Testament are analogous because of the person of Jesus Christ. So, with that brief bit of paradoxical <laughs> introduction, let's go to Psalm 35. You see the word contend there? The word contend is used twice in verse 1. It's a term that comes from the law court. It's a term that speaks of a lawyer pleading a case at the bar of justice for a client. Now, not only is God pictured as the defense lawyer, but God is pictured as the warrior judge. Now, question number one in the discussion questions is, is it inappropriate or inappropriate to think of God as a warrior? Does it bother you to speak of, of God as coming to the rescue of his people with drawn sword and flashing banner and military chariot? Does it bother you that God's a warrior? Well, if it bothers you that God's a warrior, you've never read the Old Testament. <laughs> Because I want to tell you that one of the beautiful cries of the Old Testament is, God is the God of deliverance. Now, the word deliverance is often translated in English, the word salvation. It simply means that God is the kind of God who is there when you need him. He's not an idol you pray to and hope to, but he's a God who when you need him, he's there and he acts. And the way he acts is often a very real and literal way. We have often accused God of being unfair to the Gentiles because he picked Israel and then in the New Testament being unfair to the Jews because he picked the Gentiles. And, you know, I really think that our problem is that we're trying to tell God what to do. I think if we understand the fact that, that the implication here is that God is with us, that God will defend those who know him, that God is on the side of the righteous, and though all the circumstances of life say it's about over, there's still hope in God. Friend, when Sennacherib was outside the streets of Jerusalem, and there was no hope in the world for the living Jerusalem from Sennacherib's hands. God came down as a warrior and delivered them. The Old Testament is more of an understanding of dualism in the New Testament. And the Old Testament is a, there's a, there's a real tense between the people of God and the people of this world, or the people of Satan. In my understanding of the scope of Revelation, there is not the need for God being seen as a warrior in the New Testament because we understand God not as a warrior on our side. We understand God as a creator above everything. If God is the creator above everything, then he's not on our side or anybody's side. He's God and everything else is creation. Therefore, it, it, there's not a real struggle in the universe between good and evil, God and the devil. There is God who has a plan to redeem man, and somehow Satan fits in that plan. I have no problem that God can do anything God wants to do. I don't need God fighting for me because I know that God is the creator of everything that he is. You understand that, what I'm trying to say? They understand him as a warrior because of their, because of their cultural setting. We understand him as the creator, period, and everything else way down the line. Therefore, there is not a struggle. There is simply a loving, personal, kind God that wants man to know him, and that's why Jesus came. So I think the word here is beautiful because the New Testament uses the word for defense lawyer. It calls the Holy Spirit our defense lawyer. It also calls Jesus Christ our defense lawyer in 1 John 2. That's the word paraclete. It means comes from two words, alongside, and to speak, to comfort, to, to be with. And that's what Jesus Christ is, the Holy Spirit. One called alongside to be with us in our times. Now, this is what it says. Take hold of buckler and shield. What is a buckler and a shield? You've seen those. Uh, <laughs> have you seen that McDonald's commercial lately where um, it says that uh, uh, you get a hunger buster desire... And it's got these guys who are girls who are pushing a shopping cart. And then it's got that, that guy in the museum. just a, And then, you know, you just stick the hamburger in the hole. Have you seen that? <laughs> well, the ideal of a buckler is that breastplate that thing has on. 
It's a, it's a far protection. The shield is something you carry, but the buckler is a thing you, it's a coat of mail, if you will. They didn't have McDonald's, but they had bucklers back then. <laughs> well, anyway, you see verse 3 where it says, uh, also, draw also the spear and the battle axe. Does yours have battle axe there? What does yours have? That's what? Javelin? What translation is that, Neil? Javelin is probably better. There's only one problem with the word battle axe. Jews never used it. <laughs> it wasn't a weapon that Jews knew about. They just didn't use it. So it's real hard for me to hear David say, get the spear and the battle axe and come on, when uh, he just wasn't familiar with that instrument. Now, in the Qumran literature, and you know, when I say Qumran, I'm talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in 1947. There is a word used in there that talks about the sheath or the, the socket of a javelin. Now, that it, it's not the word for javelin, it's the word for a socket for the javelin, and probably it came to note the javelin itself. Just like when we talk about, when we talk about the spurs, we're talking about cowboys, right? Well, when they talk about the socket of it for a javelin, they talk about the javelin. So probably the word here should better be javelin than battle axe. You say, oh, big deal. Well, I like javelin. <laughs> now, you see in verse 4 where it says, let those be ashamed and dishonored who seek my life, and that those turn back and, uh, and humiliated who devise evil against me. Turn to Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Daniel 12, 2. By the way, we're only going to go to Psalm 42 before we switch to Daniel, because Psalm 42 is the end of the first book of the Psalter, and we'll stop with that before we go on. The second book goes to 73. But anyway, in Daniel 12, chapter 2, it speaks about one of those things about resurrection, and uh, this is what it says, Daniel 12, 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others, and notice what the results of the others will be, disgrace and everlasting contempt or abhorrence. Now, you see what David is saying? David was saying, may these people who are after me May they be ashamed and dishonored and made a reproach and humble. It's the same idea off of the Old Testament, that the man who does not trust in God is going to be uh, brought to shame, brought to humbleness, brought to open contempt. And this is the general view of the Old Testament, not that God burned him in hell forever and ever. They didn't, they didn't have that kind of concept of hell. New Testament, they had the idea of God to shame somebody, to bring them to open reproach. That's why it's so shocking to David and to, and to Job that God would be, bring them to open reproach because that was the plight of the wicked. And, and the, uh, Job and uh, some other psalms just couldn't understand why the righteous would be humiliated and brought to shame and brought to contempt, you see. Well, here we see that David is, is asking the same thing for those who are after him. Now, verses 4 through 8 are a very peculiar kind of passage. It deals with, with David praying that God will really... Um, Sock it to them, you know. Uh, he wants them to pour the coals on their head and pour them hot, you know. And uh, you and I read that and say, shame, David. You should love those who persecute you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And when your enemy is hungry, you feed him. And when he's naked, you clothe him. And you want to burn him. <laughs> What's the matter with you, David? What is the matter with David? A principle of interpreting the Bible. Right here, very beautiful. What is it? You deal with the passage in the culture of its day, and you do not deal with the passage in a different culture, in a different time, and draw moral conclusions from our time back on their culture. You understand what I'm saying? We, from a Western Greek mindset in 20th century America, do not reflect morally on what the Jews did in 1600 B.C. Completely different setting. Completely. Now, in David's day, he was really praying for God to vindicate his own nature by what he did to the wicked. And boy, he prays, this man pull their toenails out and everything. This is, this is it. Let them be like the shaft. Blown before the wind, with the angel of the Lord driving them, 
Let their way be dark and slippery. For without cause they hid their nets for me, without cause they dug a pit for my soul. Let destruction come upon him unawares, and let the net which he he had catch himself into that very destruction that he falls. <coughs> David wasn't saying slap his hand. David was saying get him. Now, I want to go back for a minute. The word angel of the Lord only appears in two psalms. What other psalm does this appear in? Yeah, <laughs> 34 and 35. These form a real unit probably because of that. And angel of the Lord is driving these men before. Now, when we talk about idols, what, what the word idol meant, the idol is the word for nothingness or emptiness or lightness. And so is shaft. What is shaft? It's the outer side of a, some kind of kernel of, 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 of um, wheat or barley, outside husk, right? It's light. It's loose. It's empty. You see the you see the connection between the word for idols and wickedness and the word for shaft. It, it was a beautiful metaphor. It fit right in. And not just let the wind blow it, let the angel of the Lord chase them. And look at this. Let their way be dark and slippery. You get the picture of a thunderstorm at night, lightning flash every now and then. And here go the wicked running down a mountainside with an angel of God chasing them, you know. And David's praying, man, make it icy too. <laughs> you know, he really wants them to get it. And look at, look at, let's look at Proverbs 4-9. Proverbs 4-9. Hmm. 19. 4-19. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. That's exactly what he's talking about. Let them have to run in the dark and trip. Now, you think this may go back to when David had to flee in the dark? You think it's kind of a historical illusion to him having to run many times, fleeing from Saul, fleeing from Absalom? David was just run out, of, run out of town many times, fleeing at night. Maybe he goes back and say, let them experience what I've experienced. But the illusion here is, let them run in slippery places. Now, remember all through the Old Testament, when it talks about God's people, it talks about set me on a rock, right? Make my feet secure. When it talks about the evil, evil, what does it talk about? The wicked. Put their feet in miry clay. Let them slip. Let them be caught in the shifting sand. You see, the idea of the whole theological input is that God is a rock upon which to stand. But wickedness is shifting, never the same. Turmoil, looseness. So, we have that. Now, catch the idea here about, about uh, verse 8. Let the destruction come upon him unawares, and let the net which he hid himself be his very destruction. That's the paradox of evil. Uh, the very thing that people try to do to other people tends to eat them up themselves. I'll give you a beautiful example. Hatred. Friends, you can hate somebody so bad, you wish nothing good in their life. And probably that person you hate will never know it, but you know what it'll do? It'll eat your heart out. The thing that you wanted to get them will eat you up. The same thing is true of jealousy. The same thing is true, true of greed. Be careful what you plan for other people. You don't get caught in. That's the negative form of the golden rule. Now, verse 9, let's read. For my soul shall rejoice in the Lord, and shall exult in his salvation. And all my bones will say, Lord, who is like thee, who delivers the afflicted from him who is too strong for him, and the afflicted and the needy from him who robs him. Now, you see the words, my soul and my bones? The Hebrew way of speaking about myself. You could put the word myself there. Me. What is, what is really me? Let me, or well, that doesn't sound good there, let me rejoice, but um, let myself rejoice in the Lord. Now, you see the word salvation here? Is it spiritual or physical? It's the general Old Testament use of the word deliverance. It speaks of physical deliverance from physical enemies. Now, the implication there in looking back is that David also prays for spiritual deliverance because he rec recognizes his sin. But right now, he's talking about just, you know, when the boat's sinking, it's no time to 
you know, pray for anything but a, another boat. Why is the, what is the import here of the word afflicted, that God is on their side? Question number three. What is the significance about the fact that God is on the poor and afflicted side? We talked about it in Proverbs when we were there. Who's going to plead the case for the orphan and the widow? The Lord God, Yahweh, is going to plead the case for orphans and widows. I don't want to say that enough, folks. If you want to pick on somebody, better leave poor people, afflicted people, orphans and widows, and those who are downcast alone. Because when you mess with them, you're messing with God. Now, the, the Department of Welfare needs to hear that. <laughs> the Bible has a paradox, a real paradox. On one hand, it says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Very plain. The Department of Welfare needs to hear that. If you don't work, you don't eat. But the same time it needs to hear, if you don't work, you don't eat, it needs to hear. Friends, if you want to crush and be ugly and be snotty, you just do it to those who really need your help. And I want to tell you an answer to God for that. So in a real paradox, we have people, the poor are with us always. How are you going to handle them? You've got to handle them in love, and you've got to find the ones who need it. And if you leave either one off, you're not doing what's pleasing to God. Both are required. You don't give men something and do it in a condescending manner. You give it to them with dignity. But number one, you find they need it. Hear what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 11. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask of me things I do not know. They, they were accusing him of things that he couldn't even answer because he didn't know what they were accusing him of. They repay me evil for good to the bereavement of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. I went about as though it were my friend or brother. I bowed down mourning as one who sorrows for his mother. What's he saying? What's he saying? Whoever these people are, they were close friends of David. And whoever they were, when they were sick or they were in need, David prayed for them. David was concerned about them. That sackcloth and ashes is not something you do for a, a, you know, the death of a third cousin or because someone dies in the next county. That was a thing left for close relatives to do. He said, I felt like they were my own kin almost. I prayed for them. I even fasted for their good. But when it came to me, the same people that I was so concerned about and prayed for and fasted with, look what, they did, look what happened to David when he got hurt. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gave themselves together. The smiters, now King James has the cripples, and the Hebrew word means probably crippled, and people say this means Mephibosheth. Mes, mes, um, <laughs> I'm going to get it out. Mephibosheth. But I don't think that's referring to him. It's a different context. If he's in the life of David, and it very well could be, but probably not. The smiters whom I do not know gather against me. They slander me without ceasing. Like, uh, like godless jeers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. Now whose words are these? Who picks up on Psalm 35 and puts them in his own mouth? Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, this is a, probably a combination of Psalm 22 and Psalm 35. Jesus says, this is exactly what happened to me, what happened to David. For no cause, they sang to me. For no cause, they gnash their teeth and they just, they wag the head and all the rest at me. What he's saying is, I love these people and they betrayed me. Now, Here's the difference between David and Jesus, why types don't last. David said, Fuck it to him, God. Jesus said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now that's why you can't make a type between David and God. David's called a man after God's own heart, but Jesus Christ is called God in the flesh. You know, all the difference in the world between being a man that God knows and God. God says, forgive. Man says, I'm going to get him. You need to think about that. For many of us, in our hearts, hold things against people. Lord, how long will thou look on? And then skip down to verse 22 of me. Thou hast seen it, O Lord. Do not keep silent. 
O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up thyself and awake to my right and my cause, my God and my Lord. Now, last question. What does David's plea in verse 22 and also in verse 17 imply about the nature of God? Read it. What? And he comes when you call. Friend, we don't have the kind of God that's on some shelf somewhere and you bow down and pray and kiss his feet and turn incense to him and just pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and be devoted and be zealous and nothing happens. We have the kind of God that says, you pray to me and I'll hear you. Not only will I hear you, but I'll come and I'll do something about it. It may not be what you want me to do about it, but I'm going to come and I'm going to do something about it. God, the fundamental revelation of the Bible is God is a God that acts. The whole Bible is nothing more than a series of God acting in men's lives with the promise of you trust him, he'll act in your life too. God acting didn't stop with the first century. God is still in the business of acting on the part of his children. God, in contradistinction to all the other gods, is a God that acts. He does things in the history of men. Whew, that's important. That's very important. Okay. Um, 17 and 18 sound very much like other psalms. David says, promises, if you'll help me, I'll praise your name in the congregation. I'll, you know, I'll teach others your way. See that in verse 19, the thing David's worried about the most is, neither let those who hate me without cause wink the eye. David still worried. The fundamental problem David had is not in trusting God with eternity, not in trusting God with the universe, but David does not want to be made ashamed in front of everybody. He does not want them to sit over there and just kind of weep each other like, well, we got him, didn't we? The thing that David feared most, the thing that all Jews feared the most, and is normal in Eastern countries, is called loss of faith. He did not want to be ashamed in front of his people. He says, God, don't let them wink in front of me. Well, we don't much like that either, do we? For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful words against those who are, who are quiet in the land. They open their mouth wide against me, and they say, Aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. Again, the thing that David is worried about is, if those folks are going to stay back and say, Boy, did we get old David. Just look at him running in the dark. David says, God, act in my life, but they won't have the last word. Now, friends, the New Testament teaching on that is, we believe in an afterlife because the wicked and the evil and the hate and the jealousy and the pride and all this world offers to us will not be the last word on the subject. The last word will be the word of God, not the word of evil men or the word of hate or the word of sin. David prays, don't let them have the last laugh. In our in New Testament term, I would say, don't let ultimately this stand. Now, we need to have postponed it from this life to the next. We have said, God, in eternity, don't let evil stand. David said, God, in this life, don't let evil stand. Don't let evil have the last, last plea, O oh God. The New Testament of Jesus Christ says to me, evil will never have the last laugh because I read the last chapter of the book. Woo-hoo, and God won. There really never been a contest. Notice again here, verse 24. Judge me, O Lord my God, according to my righteousness. Oh, thy righteousness. You mean that David doesn't want to be judged according to his righteousness? You mean David doesn't want to be judged according to the culture of his day, righteousness? How about the enlightened ethic of the 16th century? How about the scientific age of the 20th century? I'll mark, you just mark me down. (laughs) Men in our culture think they're going to be judged by our culture. 
things that are all right for our culture to do, men feel comfortable in doing. Things that our culture says don't do, but other cultures say do, they will be judged by our culture. Men feel comfortable in their culture. But God is not going to judge by any age or any culture. The only standard of judgment on Judgment Day is not going to be, well, 100, 365 days, almost every day I loved you. God, I did good almost all the time. The standard, of, of the standard in judgment is going to be the person of God. Nobody stands in the presence of the person of God. Not the best person of any culture. Culture is not the key. The person of God is the key. So it's according to thy righteousness. And do not let them rejoice over me again. Do not let them say in their heart, Aha, our desire. Do not let them say, We have swallowed him up. Let those be ashamed and humiliated. The same words again as Daniel 12. Together who rejoice at my distress. Let, th let those be clothed with shame and dishonor. Again, this idea of Jewish idea of, of dishonor in, the, in you know, verse 27. Let them shout for joy and rejoice who favor my vindication. And let them say, continue the Lord be magnified. He delights in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall declare thy righteousness and thy praise all the day long. That is Old Testament perspective. The New Testament perspective, this last phrase, it goes something like this. The Lord, desire, the Lord delights in his servant. You see, I'm leaving the word prosperity out. The Lord delights in his servant. And the tongue shall declare thy righteousness all the day long. We don't praise God because he gets us out of trouble. We don't praise God because he answers our prayers. We don't pray God, praise God because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. We praise God because he's God in Jesus Christ. That means if you're hanging on a Roman cross, but you know Jesus Christ, even if you're Peter, you say, God, I don't understand it, but I know you. We praise God not for prosperity, but because we see in Jesus Christ the perfect example of what God is like. And we praise him because of who he is, not what he gives to us. If you praise God for what he gives to you, when he quits giving it to you, you'll quit praising him. But if you praise him because of who he is, in the darkest day of your life and the brightest day of your life, you'll praise him. Thank you, O Lord, for a time together. We don't understand, really, why David said some of the very rash things he seems to say from our perspective, O God. But I guess then that David doesn't understand how we can be so self-righteous either. So in eternity, Lord, help us to know thy will completely. And while we're here, may we know thy will in a way that's pleasing to you for us to live in our day, in our culture. God, all we can do is to be pleasing with you, with what we know about you. Therefore, O oh God, help our minds to expand in, in what your life and who you are and what you want from us. God, forgive us when we try to judge our actions by either other churches or other Christians or other countries. Help us, God, judge our actions only in the person of your Son and in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for these people here tonight. Oh, God, thank you for the time we can pray together. Bless our church, God, not because of us, but because it's your church. In Jesus' name, amen.